Okay. Well, I want to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And uh, we're going to be looking at, this is the 17th of, of 20 sessions, we're going to be exploring chapter 18. And we never want to enter the Word of God without prayer. So let's just start our hearts. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've presented us with. We know that in your kingdom there are no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. We, it is our prayer, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives as we look to learn more about our precious Messiah and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we commit this evening and ourselves. Amen. Okay. So... Uh, we're, we're uh, just to give you a, a, a step back and a broader picture. Obviously, chapter one of John was the introduction, and then from chapters two through twelve, we really focused on his ministry to the world in general. And uh, chapters thirteen to seventeen then focused especially on his disciples. And from thirteen through seventeen, it gets very, very intimate, climaxing with chapter seventeen, where you have this intimate prayer between Yeshua and the Father. Uh, it's really what we should call the Lord's Prayer. We always use that label for the disciples' prayer, where he taught the disciples how to pray. But the Lord's Prayer, the prayer between him and his Father, is detailed for you in chapter 17, where we were last time. But the reason I'm, what we're doing now is we're crossing a threshold. Uh, we're From chapters 18 to the end of the book, it covers a little bit more than 24 hours. It's the climax of the entire book. And uh, so this is a, a, a whole different flavor, if you will. Uh, it's every, everything that's gone before is in support of these 24 hours. It's interesting that uh, we speak of the Gospel of John in contrast to Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels because they have many things in common. So they're come, sometimes clustered as the synoptic Gospels in contrast to John. That's very commonly done. I think it's unfortunate because it hides the distinctives among those three, the synoptics. But nevertheless, uh, they do have some things in common, so we're not going to get into the details there. Except John's gospel is very distinctive. You'll discover that John really focuses on lofty dignity and divine glory. The agony of Gethsemane is really left to uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We'll talk about Gethsemane, but not in the same way that the other Gospels emphasize. The suffering and agony of the Savior are really amplified by the other three Gospels. John really focuses on his majesty, his lofty dignity. And it's another thing that doesn't surprise me when I come to the inference, just a conjecture on my part, that John wrote his Gospel after the Patmos experience. That doesn't occur to most people because you always think of Revelation being at the end of the Bible, so it's the last thing he did. No. I think he came back from Patmos and was in Ephesus, and that's where he wrote the Gospel of John. So he's had the benefit, the personal benefit, of the Patmos experience. So he's really focusing on the deity of Christ and his majesty and so forth to an extent that uh, beyond the others. And so... These last few chapters, these last uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, cover everything he has promised, giving eternal life, sending the Holy Spirit, preparing a place for them, his disciples, coming again for them, as highlighted in, the, in John 14, as you recall, and having them in glory with him. Very strange concept that the creator of the universe incarnate has a yearning. The very idea that God can have a yearning itself poses a theological challenge for most of us. But what is his yearning? His yearning is to have us with him. That just permeates the whole prayer with he and his father in chapter 17. And so having us in glory with him is one of his yearnings. I think that's hard to fully absorb. And uh, so all these things are contingent of what's going on to happen in the last four chapters. Without the last four chapters, there'd be no restoration of Israel. There would be no gathering of the nations. There'd be no millennium. There'd be no display of grace, no salvation, no revelation of the Father. All these things are contingent upon his death and resurrection. And he didn't just die. 
He fulfilled specification, detailed specification throughout the Old Testament. And uh, when uh, Paul defines the gospel, we use that term gospel so loosely. We throw it around so loosely. What is the gospel? Well, the good news. What does that mean? Paul defines it in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15. How that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He didn't just disappear. The best documented death on the planet Earth. But he didn't just die. He he fulfilled specific specifications. We're going to be exploring some of those. He, that he died for, uh, for, uh, for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And uh, we'll be, uh, that, that is the kernel. It's interesting what Paul did not include in the gospel. He didn't talk about his example, didn't talk about his teachings, didn't talk about the miracles. No, no. It's the, the, his, his achievements. So now uh, let's talk a little bit about the season we're in. Luke nails it for us. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Runai, which is called the Passover. I mention this because there's confusion. The word Passover is de- definitively one of the seven Mosaic feasts. But the term is used collectively for the first three feasts because they overlap. So when they speak of Passover, they can use the term connotatively rather than denotatively. I want to clear, clarify that a little bit. Uh, actually, there are three separate feasts of the Passover season. The Feast of Passover, of course, is definitively on the 14th of Nisan. No problem with that. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is on the 15th of Nisan. Now, it lasts for seven days, and that confuses people, but it's definitively the 15th of uh, the psalm. That's all this is Leviticus uh, 23. And there's another feast called the Feast of First Fruits. And it's defined as being on the morning after Shabbat after Passover. Well, if Shabbat is on a Saturday, then the morning after that would be a Sunday morning. So the Feast of First Fruits is always on a Sunday morning. Okay? And it's contained within the period of time that the F- Feast of Unleavened Bread is being observed. Have we together so far? Okay. Now, the, uh, the Passover is, in a sense, first echoed, if you will, by what they call the Akidan, Genesis 22. And uh, when Abram's told to take his son, Isaac, and they go up to the hill, and Isaac says, you, we've got the lamb, and the, we've got the, the, uh, the wood, and the, uh, where's, the, where's the lamb? And it's interesting, at the seventh verse there, how Abram says, God will provide himself a lamb. And I've always uh, regarded that as giving the kid a stall as he go up the hill. No, he looked exactly what he said. God will provide who? Himself. And uh, it's interesting that John the Baptist, when he introduces, I'm speaking not John, the, not, not the Apostle John, but John the Baptist, when he introduces Jesus Christ publicly twice, he uses a very Jewish title. Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Passover label. So Passover emerges emphatically all through here. And uh, there's all kinds of anticipatory symbolisms here. Leaven, not a bone broken. You can make a whole study of the things uh, uh, when you study the Passover of these things. And even the timing of it is interesting, that the resurrection of Christ occurs on the anniversary uh, of uh, Noah's new beginning in, uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the flood of Noah. And we'll get into that next time, more probably than this time. We have... Um, Seven feasts of Moses, three of them are in the spring. Passover, Feast of Eleven Bread, Feast of First Fruits. Three of them are in the seventh month, counting from Nisan in that sense. The Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles. So we have three in the, fr- in the spring, three in the fall. Okay, And uh, the, the first three in the spring are prophetic of the first kind. They all have a, pro- each feast has a prophetic aspect as well as a commemorative aspect. And that's very, very worthwhile to really explore. We won't be, obviously, we'll just be touching on it superficially here. But the, uh, the, the three spring feasts fo- focus on his first advent, and the three fall feasts will impact his, uh, give us a perspective of second advent. And there's one in between, a very strange one called Shavuot, or the Feast of uh, Weeks, or in the Greek we'd call it the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, many people recognize its prophetic influence as, pro- as prophesying the church. But what they also may overlook is that it may have an unfulfilled part yet also. And we'll get to that next time probably. But one of the things that I want you to deal with yourself, don't accept this because it happens to be my point of view. 
I will share with you what my point of view is and why I hold it, but I'm not here to sell it. I'm anxious for you to come to your own conclusions. So what we're trying to do is equip you to, to look behind uh, the, the, uh, uh, some of these controversies. Did the crucifixion occur on Friday or Wednesday? The church, the Christian church, for most of its history, has talked about Good Friday as the day of the crucifixion. Well, there's some debate exactly whether it's Wednesday or Thursday. I won't get into that here particularly. But the main point is I think you can, in your notes, note that there are at least three reasons why it could not have been on Friday. Jesus specified there'd be three days and three nights. Those are his words between the crucifixion and the resurrection in Matthew 12:40. So you have to deal with that. There's no way to get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. Okay. Um, we also know that Jesus traveled from Jericho to Bethany six days before Passover. And so we know that that would require more than a Sabbath day's journey if Passover was on a Friday. And it wasn't on that week, obviously. That's the point. And finally, there are two Sabbaths between Passover and Sunday morning. And it's amazing how many translations, even modern translations, miss the error that's in the King James. And uh, the, uh, the, the the Sabbaton in the Greek is a plural noun. And there are two Sabbaths. In, uh, in, in Matthew 28, verse 1, your King James says, when the Sabbath was passed, this, uh, the, in the Greek it's plural, clearly plural. And the, the only place I've seen that caught is in the International Standard Version Bible. I'm aware of that only because I'm on the review committee, and the, so for what it's worth. But that means that there were two there were two Sabbaths that week. Now, see, Passover can be any day of the week. It can be uh, depending on what year it is, because it's nailed to the calendar, and the calendar shifts because of a disconnect between the lunar solar calendar and the sidereal calendar. So, the nice on the 14th can be any day of the week, depending on what year you're looking at. And what we do know is the the, the year that we're talking about. We know that Jesus' body was discovered, the, uh, the empty tomb was discovered on the first day of the week, on Sunday. And the only way that implies that Nisan was on, the, on a Wednesday. The third day is the day, as we, as we explored when we were in the wedding at Cana, the third day is a Tuesday, the day of, of double blessing. But in any case, uh, Passover would have been on a, a Wednesday. And... Uh, the following day, the 15th, would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we have the, uh, the we have the, uh, when the Sabbaths, plural, were passed. You see, there's, there's two passes. I'll show you the two, the, uh, the two uh, uh, Sabbaths. If the, 14th of Passo- if the 14th of Nisan is passed, remember the Jewish day starts at sundown. It's the evening and the morning. It all derives from the entropy reductions in Genesis in the first uh, in, the, in Genesis chapter one, so 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 the uh, we have it start on the, the the night, if you will, of of the fourteenth, and uh, you take three days and three nights, and that, uh, that we, at the end of the Sabbath, the plural. Well, there's two Sabbaths. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the fifteenth, and there's the Shabbat on the seventeenth. When the Sabbaths plural were passed. They discovered the body. Now, when did when did the resurrection take place? Most people say Sunday morning. Not necessarily. Resurrection probably took place Saturday night. Okay, or excuse me, yeah. In effect, uh, after midnight Sunday. In other words, after uh, the empty tomb was discovered Sunday morning. And uh, so, uh, at least this is one rendering. There are good scholars that still have slightly different points of view, but the main thing to recognize is not to shackle yourself to traditions that we know are not true. Okay, let's see here. So the final week, this is one reckoning. Good scholars will have a slightly different reckoning, but this is one view. At Friday, they're at Bethany. Saturday is the triumphal entry. Sunday is the... If this is correct, by the way, then the uh, Palm Sunday is not on Sunday. It's on Saturday by this reckoning. Now, there's some people that would argue that. Uh, Sunday, we have the fig tree cursed and so forth. Monday, we have the conspirators council. And... uh, Tuesday, we have the Last Supper, between the evenings, if you will, and Wednesday is the crucifixion, Thursday is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Friday is when the women prepare the spices, and then Saturday, they rested after after the Shabbat, the plural from Matthew 21, and finally, Sunday, he is risen, we have the empty tomb. This is one reckoning, and um, there are uh, 
almost every reckoning you find has some questions it raises. So I'm not here to sell this particular one. I'm just saying this is one approach to try to reconcile what we think we know. And so I'll leave that with you to sort through in your notes. And uh, the, thing, the main thing to understand is the Jewish year includes more than the 50, 52 Saturdays of a year. Those are the Shabbats. They have seven more additional high Sabbaths in the year. And that's how you get through into the 70 uh, Hamoyadim, the uh, appointed times, by adding all those up with the other holidays and so forth. Okay, so let's just jump in finally. And uh, chapter 18, verse 1, And when Jesus had spoken, had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where he, there was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. Now, um, it's uh, interesting that he, John does not use the term Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the term that we use for the garden there. It, it had an olive press and so forth. But um, the, uh, the, the name Gethsemane is omitted. John uses a different uh, appellation. He, he speaks of the Brook Kidron. Now on the east side of Jerusalem, you have the temple area. On the east side, and east of that, there's a, a uh, the Kidron Valley. The Brook Kidron goes through there to the Mount of Olives. At the base of the Mount of Olives is where we have we find Gethsemane, but he's calling it he's used, he's describing it as the same uh, uh, in a little different way. The book Kidron really refers to dark black waters. There's he's using a a uh, an ominous flavor here, uh, and. Uh, um, it, it, it's worth knowing that the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the sin offering, in, in contrast to the burnt offering, was outside the camp, from Leviticus 4 and so forth, uh, uh, without the gate, outside. And so, but one of the things that I think is interesting to do is to contrast the two gardens. The Garden of Eden, of, of Genesis 3, and the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the Garden of Eden, everything was delightful. And uh, in Gethsemane, everything was terrible. Adam and Eve parlayed with Satan in Eden. The last Adam sought the face of his father in Gethsemane. In uh, Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, the Savior suffered. In uh, Eden, Adam fell. In Gethsemane, a Redeemer conquered. We have the first and the last Adam, if you will, that to those terms that the scripture uses. Speaking of the Savior as the last Adam. And uh, the Eden was by day and, of course, Gethsemane by night. Adam fell before Satan, and the one soldiers fell before Christ and the other. In uh, Eden, the race was lost, but in Gethsemane, of them none is lost. We'll find when we get to verse 9 of this chapter here shortly. Adam took fruit from Eve's hand, Eve's hand in the Garden of Eden, and Christ received the cup from his father's hand in Gethsemane. And uh, Adam hid himself. The, second, the last Adam, Christ, boldly showed himself. And God sought Adam in the one case, and the last Adam sought God in the second case. And Adam was driven from Eden. Christ was led from Gethsemane. In Eden, the sword was drawn, and in Gethsemane, the sword with sheath. So there's an interesting contrast between the two, of, uh, even just, the, just in the metaphors involved. But let's move on. Uh, it highlights here that Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. And it's interesting, there are some, some scholars that suspect that the Gethsemane was a private place where they used to meet a lot, owned perhaps by a friend. And uh, so those are speculations but uh, that uh, Judas knew the pattern, so that became his target, if you will. And you may remember, as from where we studied the Last Supper, this was not the planned timing. They were not planning to do this during the Passover season. It's the worst possible time from a sensitivity of the Romans' point of view. But Jesus called their bluff. And he announced it at the Last Supper, and that caused Judas to have to fish or cut bait. And so he had to leave and hustle the arrangements that were required. So uh, Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Wow. Okay, a band of men. Now the Greek term there implies a tenth of a legion, a cohort. 
Uh, this could be from 400 to 600 men. We do know there were 600 men stationed at the Atonia Fortress. In fact, the, ter the formal title of the chief of these guys that occurs later on in verse 12 um, is, that, is the captain of this detachment. Detachments that implies that they were all present. So that sounds like a good crowd that they've assembled. And that's just the, uh, the Romans. On top of that, you had temple police also present. The same ones that had failed previously, if you may recall, back in chapter 7. And so uh, there's a crowd. This is, this is, and uh, probably anticipating that they were going to get the disciples as well as Jesus, the whole gang, if you will. Well, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And it's interesting. When they went to Gethsemane, the disciples grouped down, but three went for a little further with him, and then he went a little further yet. So he's, he's sort of in the vanguard when they were praying. But now he steps out, and he comes forward. Jesus is advancing to meet them himself. He went forth and said, Whom seek ye? And, uh, you know, knowing all this, see, notice how John is, uh, just has it right in, in, in his uh, uh, focus here that Jesus is, is deity. He knew all things. He knew that he was to be taken from him, and he also knew he'd be cut off and have nothing. And that's a quote from Daniel 9, when we studied the 70 week prophecy. And that's exactly what Gabriel told Daniel back there in the 26th verse of Daniel 9. And, and so Jesus is obviously aware of that. He knows, he's no, he knows what's coming. And, uh, and John always emphasizes this. He emphasizes divine knowledge in verse 4. He emphasizes divine power in verse 6. And he emphasizes divine protection in verses 8 and 9. So, J so John is presenting this very familiar story to most of us from that point of view especially. That's his emphasis. And he went forth um, alone. And he's, he's stepping forth. He's not, you know, he's not going there in a sense of having protection. He says, who am seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Not Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah. No, Jesus of Nazareth is the label they're using. Jesus saith unto them, I am. The he is added by the King James translators. Another one of these I am statements that we've been studying. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And, uh, you know, it's interesting here. In the other cases where he makes an I am statement of some kind, he always accompanies that with the remark, be not afraid. The woman at the well back in John 4 made his I am statement, but he said, be not afraid. And uh, at the storm lashed sea in John 6, same thing. He made an I am statement, and yet he says, be not afraid. It's noteworthy that here he uses an I am statement, and he does not tell them, be not afraid. There's good reason for them to be afraid. And I think that's relevant. And so... And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, with my apologies to some of the, the uh, charismatic preachers who, uh, they like to use the term slain of the spirit. I don't think that is it by any way what's going on here. At the ineffable name of God, they went backward. They fell uh, back on the ground. And this is not being slain in the spirit, as some people like to, to use that term in a different context altogether. No. This is something quite distinctive. Now, I want to also notice this is a voluntary deliverance. He was not captured. He actively offered himself. And I want that's going to be characteristic of everything that unfolds here. And the only thing that kept him on that cross that we're going to see in chapter 19 is his love for you and me. The nails didn't hold him there. They say he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. We got the Creator incarnate, and at any any point along the proceedings here, he could have said, "Enough already! I'm out of here." No, the nails didn't hold him that cross. His love for you and me did, and uh, and that also holds true of his father. It's, to those of you that are fathers, it's astonishing to try to appreciate the father's forbearance in allowing the abuse of his son and not blowing the whistle, so to speak. We will explore that in the, in when we get to chapter 19. Then he asked them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And so, notice he's not saying Christ. And uh, he answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. Notice who's giving the orders here. Notice he's giving the orders. Let these go their way. 
That's a command, not a suggestion. They're about to tie his hands, but he first tied theirs. They had intended to seize them all, obviously. Mark brings that out in chapter 14 a little more clearly. Now, Jesus had to suffer alone. It's interesting when you study Leviticus 16 that the high priest on Yom Kippur, uh, to go and make atonement, had to, there was no other man in the tabernacle at that time. It was cleared of all. The, the high priest had to do it alone. That's emphasized in Leviticus 16. And that's exactly what Jesus, Jesus had to, what was coming had to be on his own alone. That's the specification. But there's also an uh, emblem and a pledge of their acquittal and their discharge of their debts. The shepherd was protecting his sheep, in effect. And uh, so he saw to it that they were freed and on their way. And uh, as John points out here, he says, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Now that rings familiar in your ears because we just studied that when we saw studied Psalm 16, or, or uh, excuse me, the the high the high, the prayer Jesus prayer in John 17, all through there of those that you gave me he says to his father, of of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Remember, I want you to notice something very provocative here that most people miss, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake and then he quotes that. You see that so often, especially by Matthew, where Matthew is uh, mentioning what has been fulfilled from the Old Testament. That's not what this is. This is a fulfillment of something that John wrote in his gospel in chapter 17, that the saying might be fulfilled. So that occurs twice in this chapter, here in verse 9 and also in verse 32. This is not an echo of an Old Testament statement like we often see elsewhere. At this time, the New Testament was being collected at Ephesus. John is placing this gospel on a par with the Old Testament scripture. And that, surprise, you know, that may come as a surprise, but if you think that through, um, it fits, if you will. And that's another reason I believe all this occurred after Patmos. So, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. <laughs> the servant's name was Malchus. And uh, so it was unlawful, by the way, to carry a weapon on a feast day. And we know there's two swords that were present. Luke points that out to us. To give you a feeling for this sword, it was probably 18 inches long, weighed about 5 pounds. It was thick, not sharp. It was designed for splitting helmeted skulls. Peter missed. Okay? <laughs> and so... He cut off, and the word there in the Greek is to tear or rip, if you will, not to slice. His aim may have been off, but whatever. And so uh, and it was fortunate that he was, and of course Jesus heals the, the servant, which if for no other reason, it saves Peter's life. And so, and the servant's name was Malchus. And so uh, uh, Peter, he was, a, he's, he was courageous when he should be still, and he's going to be cowardly when he should have been courageous, but that's coming yet. So, but the servant being healed here is the last miracle before the cross. And it's interesting to make the observation that no one ever died in Christ's presence. I think that's interesting. Now, there is the uh, insight here that John apparently knew this servant personally, because he mentions his name. That leads to a, a rather minor controversy you should be aware of. Um, and by the way, according to Jewish law, it was unlawful to bind a prisoner before condemnation, and they're going to bind Jesus here. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword unto thy sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And uh, that's the, there are, the, the, the idea of a cup is used all through the scripture, of, of a portion of a burden, if you will. The cup of salvation in Psalm 116. My cup runneth over in Psalm 23. The, the, let this cup pass. One of the most astonishing insights is the prayer that Jesus prays in the, in the garden in Gethsemane. Because he agonizes and prays, if there's any other way, let's take it. Yet, not my will, but thine be done. He prays that three times. And that's a very, very profound prayer. If there's any other way for someone to be reconciled to God other than through Jesus, 
God didn't hear his prayer. That prayer was in vain. You've got to think that through. Three times he prayed that. Let this cup pass from me. We also have the cup of tribulation as a term used in Psalm 11, Jeremiah 25, and elsewhere. So that you can make almost a study of cups. There's a, it's an, a metaphor, if you will, of a portion, typically of a burden. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a metaphor very similar, close to the idea of the bowls that are poured out in, in the Revelation, um, in, the, in the judgments and so forth. We're now going to be in, in exposed to six trials. Um, there are three Jewish trials, one before Annas, one before Caiaphas, and one before the Sanhedrin. And uh, then we, what follows that will be three Roman trials. Before Pilate to begin with, when he finds out that he's a Galilean, he tries to pawn that off on Herod, but that doesn't work. And then he comes back before Pilate. So we really got six sessions, if you will, or six trials, if you will. We won't go through all of them. We'll focus primarily on the ones that John details for us. And the first one, of course, is before Annas, starting at verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. And uh, Annas served from 86 through 15, deposed by Pilate's predecessor, Valerius Gratus. So even though he's deposed, he is still the influential one because as far as the Jews are concerned, he, is the, he would be the high priest and for life according to God's rules. He was the vice president of the Sanhedrin also and a patriarch of a family that held the office of the high priest as late as 8062, including five sons and a son-in-law. So he's very, very influential even though he was deposed and the Romans appointed his son-in-law, Caiaphas, uh, in charge. So we have, in effect, a... a uh, an influential, widely accepted uh, Annas and uh, the uh, technically uh, appointed uh, Caiaphas. Then the band of the captain officers of the East took Jesus and bound him. And again, uh, uh, see the Romans appointed Caiaphas each year, according to Acts 4, and that's in contrast to the law of God, which he should have been appointed till death, according to the Torah. And uh, so many Jews obviously res resented the Roman intrusions into their office. They still looked to Annas, not Caiaphas, as the real high priest. But both of these guys, Annas and Caiaphas, will stand before Jesus in judgment at the end. That's got to be an interesting scene. And they bound him like Isaac, and we've talked about that. And uh, just as he's bound there, we're bound by sin long before he was bound, in a sense. And they led him away to Annas first, and for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. So he's led uh, to the priest first, and they would pass the sheep gate, by the way, on the way there. And uh, it's interesting to realize the judge had given his verdict and determined the sentence before the trial took place. The legal hand of the nations, the purpose and character of the son's death, he was dying for the people. Caiaphas even had predicted that. Uh, uh, earlier. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And uh, that, that is, uh, that's, you, may re, you may recall where Caiaphas indicated that back in when we studied chapter 11. So I'll just echo back there. And Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Now, most commentators presume that this other disciple was John himself. And there are some others, though, that debate that. Not a big deal, but just so you're aware of it, that um, according to Acts 4, verse 13, the high priest was not personally acquainted with either Peter or John. And John didn't refer to himself as another disciple. He often referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He had his way of, of making that allusion. So this is not necessarily John. In fact, there's arguments by some scholars that it couldn't have been John or Peter because neither one were known to the high priest because the Acts 4 reference. So uh, why, why not? Well, John, by the way, is a poor fisherman of Galilee, not in Jerusalem. And as a Galilean, he would have, he, he would have been recognized as Peter was. Peter was recognized by his speech. That's what led to his, his uh, embarrassment, if you will. John always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he does that five times in this gospel. So the other possibility is that uh, 
who are they? Well, Nicodemus may be a good selection because both Nicodemus was active and obviously very influential. And he's the one that negotiated the surrender and the, and the her family did uh, in AD 70. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea, we believe, is, was, uh, we're going to get to him later, but he, was, he had access to the to Pilate, which means he was not a casual guy. He was a very powerful guy. He, was a, he also was in secret. And I'll get back to that and what that's all about in the, in the next session. But Joseph of Arimathea was uh, probably the owner of the region that we know today as the, the, uh, the Garden Tomb and all that. And so either one of them may well, they may have been, one, of the, one or both of them may have been the, gave, gave them access. But Peter, anyway, stood at the door without, and then went out that other disciple, which is known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. So he got access, if you will. And then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art that not thou also one of this man's disciples? Peter said, I am not. So that's his first chance to get himself in trouble. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And uh, see, following Christ afar off can result in getting chills. Well, anyway, we're going to go, at this about, it's about this time that we shift from Annas to Caiaphas, about verse 19. So it's a second trial, if you will. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine, what they're trying to, they're trying to entrap him here, or ensnare him. And uh, Jesus answered, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. And so uh, he spoke openly, not in secret. And this is the, in contrast to this trial, which is a closed uh, situation. And why not call witnesses? He says, I, I spoke to the world. That's the universality of his message. And he speaks of, makes specific reference to the Jews later. No, no witnesses called in the entire trial, by the way, of, of, uh, in his favor. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Now, the, uh, the text seems to say he struck with the palm of his hand. There's a debate about the exegesis. It might have been with a rod. There's some technicalities involved. I won't try to unravel that. If it is with a rod, it would echo, be echoed of Micah 5.1, but that's not critical. And the, the point is, though, he was entitled to be protected by the judges. And there is, of course, no protection given. All. We'll go through the illegalities here shortly. And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas, as I think I've given you a little bit of background, his real name is Joseph, held office to but from A.D. 18 through about 36. And according to Josephus and other rabbinical writings, he had a reputation for intrigue, bribery, and love money. Both the characters, Annas and Caiaphas, were scoundrels. Both of them um, full of intrigue, bribery, um, so forth. Very, there's a very, very bad reputation behind both of them. But this whole trial, of course, is a farce. They have false witnesses are, are sought. Two, just as Jezebel used against Naboth back in 1 Kings 18, which is a parallel study you should be very familiar with for a lot of reasons. And they had no death penalty authority, by the way. That, that's a key point I want to get at. They did not have a death penalty authority. And what's all that about? We'll get to that in a minute. Let's take a look at the, pa the uh, passage from Matthew 26, just to get a little, uh, he focuses on this a little, in a little more detail. In Matthew 26, he says, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest rose and said, And answers thou nothing? What is it that these witnesses said against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be, Christ, be the Christ or the Son of God. What he's doing here is requiring, under the law, Jesus had to answer, so he does. And so uh, the oath that he administered, in effect, is, runs like this, apparently. 
I adjure thee by the living God in whose office I stand, under whose power we all are, before whom thou also standest, who knowest the truth and judgest between us and thee, that thou tellest this holy Sanhedrin now here as before God the truth. So Jesus was required by law to respond according to Leviticus 5.1 and other passages. So Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, in other words, we would say it in our English, you said it, okay, he's underscoring it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest ran his clothes saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Well, now, the uh, high priest here, by the way, violated Leviticus 21.10. He's, he was not supposed to tear his clothes. But uh, anyway, that's... Uh, uh, but he understood, though, that he was claiming to be God. So that's the positive uh, of this. And uh, so the problem with that is that this logic is that it's self-incrimination, which is also in, in Jewish law, that your own testimony cannot be used against you. So it's, a, it's an interesting paradox that's emerged here. But the garment torn, of course, is, is something that happens when there's no more use for it, like the temple veil and so forth. That'll happen later. And the, and the, anyway, the high priest continued, What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? And that's the Matthew part. Let's get back to John here. Meanwhile, outside... Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, and they said therefore unto him, Art but not thou one also of his disciples? And he denied it, said, I am not. Then one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? And then Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Now there's a lot of discussion, because in another one of the Gospels, it says when, the, when he denies him thrice, the he, he, he will deny him thrice before the cock go twice. And so some people think that's a discrepancy. I don't see how it is, by the way. Uh, that's neither here. There's even some scholars say that he must have denied nine times. And all the silly discussions that occur. It's a, I've never heard a cock crow only once anyway. I've been living on a farm. Cocks usually crow more than once, I think. So before the cock goes twice, he will have denied him thrice. Okay. And, and he did three times. So I don't see what the problem is. But moving on. This is about 3 in the morning, by the way, to give you a feeling for this. Third watch of the night. And, uh, and there's some lessons here. One of the things you could do in your notes is to make a list of the lessons you can learn from this experience. The believer is as weak as water. I think that's true of all of us. The danger of self-confidence. We, one of the great insights about Peter is that we fumble in our, not in our weak suit, in our long suit. Our most dangerous skill is the one that we're strongest in, because that's usually the source of pride, and that causes the big falls. And uh, but anyway, also the consequences of prayerlessness. He should have been praying. He was sleeping in Gethsemane. And uh, Jesus said, "Could you not watch for one hour? Three times, not once." And uh, and of course the perils of companionship. He should have been out there with the wicked. That got he got himself entrapped. So each one of these is a, a, a point of departure for some devotion to apply to our own lives. The influence of the fear of men. And uh, so Peter's going to have that hanging around his neck for throughout eternity. The Lord will uh, forgive him from all of that. That will all take place in chapter 21 when we get there. Some of the lessons here. Before we judge Peter too severely... Let's examine ourselves. How many times have we denied the Lord and lost opportunities to share the gospel with others? I, mean, I think all of us have had experiences that we look back on and realize that we were timid or we, we have no idea what might have occurred had we not been quite so passive, quite so timid, what, whatever. That applies to every one of us. Do we talk when we should listen? I know I do. I have this uh, foot and mouth disease that Peter had, you know. One of the interesting things, by the way, is just a contrast, is to study Peter before Acts 2. You'll discover he's always putting his foot in his mouth, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. From Acts chapter 2 on, there's a different Peter you encounter. His sermon in Acts chapter 2, his sermon in Acts chapter 3 are astonishing 
astonishingly eloquent, well-organized, pithy uh, uh, presentations. You can just study those and see the impact of the Holy Spirit, the difference between the two. Interesting study. When should do, do we argue when we should obey? Do we sleep when we should pray, like Peter did? Yes, of course. Do we fight when we should submit? Now, Peter did repent, of course, and the Lord, after a private meeting with him, did forgive him, as we will encounter uh, uh, and, and, and uh, forgive him publicly there in John 20 when we get to the last chapter. Okay, so we've looked at a couple of the Jewish trials. Matthew deals with the confrontation with the Sanhedrin. We'll skip that to go on to uh, the, the encounter with Pilate. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, for it was early, and they, let, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now this, <laughs> this almost sounds like a humorous insertion to me. Here they are, because they're Jewish and it's a holiday, they could not defile themselves by entering Gentile domain. So they, they didn't go in the judgment hall. They would stay at the border of that. And Pilate agreed to meet them there. But they're, they're straining over a technicality of the law while they're trying to railroad a guy into debt to the death penalty, violating every one of their laws. Uh, it, it, the irony here is, is almost humorous. And uh, form versus substance. And uh, so before Pilate, now Pilate, I think you, you know that uh, if you go to visit... Uh, Caesarea, you can find a, a plaque that they found that actually identifies him there and so forth. He was the procurator of Judea from 26 to 36, and uh, he was deposed by Vitellius, sent to Rome. He tried, probably executed under Caligula, interestingly enough. There's no documentation of it. There are people, there, there are traditions that he, he came to faith at the end, especially among the Coptics in Egypt. They have traditions about this, but they haven't been able to find any documentation of it. Uh, he did, though, rule Judea in a reckless and arbitrary fashion throughout his career. Josephus points out that he used temple funds to build an aqueduct, and when people protested, they were beaten by Roman soldiers. So he was an abusive guy. And so, now, the, 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 uh, this is going to take place at the Praetorian, which is the, uh, derived from the Latin Praetorium, which is the name of the official residence of the Roman governor. And... Uh, it's probably in western Jerusalem. It might be in the Antonia, For uh, Antonia Fortress, just north of the temple. We're not sure. There's different scholars that debate on where it actually took place. It was early, the fourth watch of the evening, about 3 to 6 a.m. probably. And, uh, but we have a ritual here of subs uh, sus uh, substance. They were defiled if they entered a Gentile home, but they made blatant violations of all his trial rights as of the accused the 30 pieces of silver versus the temple treasury, all that nonsense. Execution of the Messiah on Passover itself is something actually they were going to try to avoid, but that's actually what's going to occur here. Now all this fulfills the prediction of Gentile jurisdiction in Mark. In Mark 10, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be given to the Gentiles for here, and this is exactly what's happening here. His disciples could not watch one hour. His enemies continued all night because Passover was that day. Details of ritualism versus the illegal trial is, 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 is astonishing, actually. Christ will banish ritualism, and ritualism will banish Christ. You want to watch out for ritualism in any shape or form. Now, by the way, another observation. Not all Pharisees were necessarily involved. For example, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. A quorum was 23, majority of two required, so as few as 13 could have been responsible for the whole program. That's a provocatively small number. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? It was Pilate's meeting him out there so they don't get defiled. The Roman law required three things. It... Uh, there you go. A specific indictment. Uh, and bringing the accusers before the accused, and um, liberty grant to the accused to answer for himself. Those were, they, those were the Roman requirements. And uh, Pilate went out to them. See, his interest was piqued. Their bluff was called. He came out to talk to them. Okay. And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. A rather snotty response, by the way, to give to the procurator. 
Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. See, that's the rub. That's the thing that's lying underneath there. If it wasn't for that, they, they would have been... That's why they're before him, because they don't have the authority. And there's a thing behind that you want to understand when he talks about your law. And uh, so let's take a look at that. Back in Genesis 49, there's a very interesting verse. Jacob is standing on a staff. He's predicting, uh, pro prophesying over each of the 12 tribes. When he's prophesying over Judah, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And uh, the term scepter here refers to their tribal identity, the right to apply and enforce Mosaic laws, and to adjudicate, uh, adjudicate uh, capital offenses. And uh, what's called just gladiator. And it's, uh, it's significant that even in their 70-year Babylonian captivity, the tribes retained their tribal identity, interestingly enough. They retained their own logistics, judges, and so forth, according to Ezekiel 1. And uh, so the term Shiloh was understood by the early rabbis and Talmudic authorities as referring to the Messiah. It's a term that can mean several things, but here it was understood to be referring to the Messiah. Now, so, uh, the scepter is, again, the tribal identity and the right to apply Mosaic laws. And Shiloh, to whom it belongs, and it's a messianic term here. What's interesting, though, the reason I get into this here, there's some history you might be finding interesting. Archelaus was the second son of Herod the Great. The older son, Herod Antipater, was murdered by Herod the Great along with the other family members. That's all in Joseph, Josephus, of course. Archelaus' mother was a uh, Samaritan, a quarter or less of Jewish blood, and was never really accepted. After the death of Herod, about, eight, uh, about 4 BC, Archelaus had been placed over Judea as ethnarch by Caesar Augustus. He, but he was broadly rejected, dethroned, and banished in 6 to 7 AD, if you will. So what happens then? Herod Archelaus was replaced by a Roman procurator named Caponius. The legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and adjudication of capital cases was lost. This was normal Roman policy. And this is uh, in the Jerusalem Talmud, but it's also in Josephus' War of the Jews and so forth. Now, what's interesting is that when the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived over their right over life and death, they covered their heads with ashes and bodies with sackcloth and bemoaned as follows, as quoted in the Babylonian Talmud. Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah, and the Messiah has not come. The members of the Sanhedrin marched around the city in, ash, in, in, in ashes, convinced that the word of God had been broken because the scepter had departed and the Messiah hadn't come from that verse. Follow me? And they really, they, that's what they believed. They should have known better because see, there was, they didn't realize that there was a young carpenter's son growing up in Nazareth at that time. The Messiah had come. They just didn't, they didn't, they didn't uh, realize it. And then when he does show up, they missed the whole point on, on, on the you know, on the triumphal entry. Now, again, interesting that the, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. See, if he died a Jewish death, what would have been his method of execution? Stoning, exactly. And uh, so, but we know from Psalm 22 and all through the, the Old Testament that he was going to be crucified. That was a technique that was invented by the Persians, but widely adopted by the Romans, and uh, obviously became very characteristic of the Roman punishments. And so this, uh, so, and it's interesting, it's, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. No, it had to be the Romans. And so, uh, and the, the, the death was usually for, uh, for among, among stoning, it was for blasphemy. It's very interesting when you study Revelation chapter 16, one of the final big judgments in Revelation is 100 pound hailstones. The nations do get stoned for blasphemy. It's interesting though, they didn't seek permission in the case of Stephen. He got martyred without the benefit of the, of the Roman jurisprudence here. And of course, blasphemy was not a crime by Romans. There were three other charges. Treason could not be ignored, of course, by them. And where were the Gentile witnesses? Paul says, am I a Jew? 
So this is the first of six attempts by Pilate to release Jesus. He said, you judge him, and you'll see that in verse 31. He is innocent, he'll declare in verse 38. The Jews substitute Barabbas when he offered a choice. They substitute Barabbas. A partial punishment was administered in 19.1 with, uh, that we'll see next chapter. And he, Pilate tried to play on their pity, if you will. It didn't work. Behold your king, and so forth. So, and Pilate said, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. My kingdom is not of this world, is a statement indeed. And that all echoes from Daniel 7, 13, and, and Luke 19, and so on. And so, so then you are a king, in effect, is what Pilate says. And it's interesting that Jesus does not appeal to his messianic credentials. In fact, Paul even indicates that he had a good confession because it came out for, it, 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 Paul qualifies the response that Jesus gave here in his letter to Timothy, chapter 6. So the important point here is Pilate formally recognizes Jesus as king with the inscription he puts on the cross. We'll see that dramatized in the next chapter. And uh, I want to point out there is a Middle Ages tradition. We can't find the documentation for it, but the Pilate, before his death, was converted. So it would not surprise me to run into Pilate in heaven. We'll see. Pilate said, what is truth? And when he said, when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said to them, I find in him no fault at all. Here again, he uh, announces his, his innocence, which means he should have, as a Roman administrator, released him at that point. That's what he, was, he should have done. And he gives a cynical, what is truth? And people, what is truth? I've never seen anybody give a good answer to that. My wife gave me one some years ago. I've never forgotten it. The truth is when the word and the deed become one. Wow. When God's word becomes incarnate, that's, he is, I'm the way, the truth, and life, he, he declares. I think that's terrific. I find in him no fault at all. He pronounced him innocent, should have released him. According to Roman law, everything following is illegal. I've got the chief priest's remonstrance in, in Mark 15. Pilate sends him to Herod and, to, and abuse. Because he heard he was Galilean, he thought that he'd give the, give the problem to Herod. That didn't work. Herod was too slippery for that. Then he tries something else. He, he, he Pilate to the, to the crowd, he says, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Pilate thought might, that might be an escape clause for him. Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And uh, John doesn't really elaborate on all of this here, but uh, the word Barabbas, you know, you know enough, you know enough Hebrew to know what that what the name means. Bar, son of Bar Jonah, Simon by Jonah, son of, he's son of Abbas. What is Allah? Father, son of the father. And uh, you can, Jesus said in John 5:43, "I've come in my Father's name, and him you can, and him you have not received." Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Now, that's probably a double reference. There's a minor reference of it here, a more substantial reference in the Antichrist. It's a, into what some people call a double reference, probably. Barabbas, interesting. Interesting guy, in a sense. He stood under the righteous condemnation law. He knew he was guilty. He was clearly guilty. No issue there. He knew the one who was to take his cross and take his place was innocent. He knew, Barabbas knew he was guilty. He also knew that this other guy was innocent. He knew that Jesus Christ was for him a true substitute, right? You following me so far? He knew that he had done nothing to merit going free while another took his place. Think about each of those conditions. He was under the righteous condemnation. He knew that the other guy was innocent. He knew that Christ was a true substitute. And he knew he had done nothing to merit the substitution. You with me so far? They changed places. The murderous bonds, curse, disgrace, and mortal agony were transferred to the righteous Jesus. 
while the liberty, the innocence, the safety, and well-being of the Nazarene became the lot of the murderer. Do you see the flip over? Why am I hammering this? Because you and I are in... But see, Barabbas has installed all the rights and privileges of Jesus Christ while the latter enters upon all the infamy and horror of the rebel's position. The delinquent's guilt and cross become the lot of the just one, and the civil rights and immunities of the latter are now the property of the delinquent. And why? where are you and I? You and I are in Barabbas' shoes. Everything true of Barabbas is true of us. We know we are guilty. We've done nothing merit for, we, to merit the substitution. Your justification is a done deal. It was done on a wooden cross in Judea, erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. Now Pilate, he knew that for envy they had delivered him. He, th he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. These are quotes from Pilate. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Pilate therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them in Luke 23. I found no cause of death in him, he declares again. I find in him fault, no fault at all, as it's quoted in John. From thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. And we'll find that in, John, in the next chapter. Pilate, when he was determined to, uh, to, uh, to let him go, in Acts, is mentioned in Acts chapter 3. So there's illegal, let's just get, quickly go through the illegal right, irregular, the legal irregularities to get a perspective. The binding of a prisoner before he's condemned was unlawful unless resistance was offered or expected. Jesus offered none. It was illegal for judges to participate in the arrest of the accused. That was illegal. No legal transactions, including a trial, could be conducted at night. The arrest was effected through a traitor. That was forbidden, by the way. While an acquittal could be pronounced the same day, any other verdict required a majority of two and had to come on a subsequent day. Interesting legal point. No prisoner could be convicted on his own evidence. It was the duty of a judge to see the interests of the accused were fully protected. Boy, that's a joke. Preliminary hearings before a magistrate were completely foreign to the Jewish legal system. It was illegal to carry weapons on a feast day. The use of violence during the trial was apparently unopposed by the judges. The judges sought false witnesses against Jesus. These are all the illegal steps. In a Jewish court, the accused was to be assumed innocent until proved guilty by two or more witnesses. The Jews failed to find two witnesses agreeing against Jesus. When the witnesses first disagreed, the prisoner should have been released. No witness was ever called for the defense. The trial under Caiaphas took place in his home rather than the council chamber where it should be held. The Jews failed to find two witnesses agreeing against Jesus. When the witnesses first disagreed, the prisoner should have been released. No witness was ever called for the defense. The court lacked the civil authority to condemn a man to death. It was illegal to conduct a session of a court on a feast day. A guilty verdict was rendered without evidence. The balloting was illegal. It should have been by roll with the youngest voting first. Here it is simultaneous. The sentence is finally passed in the palace of the high priest, but the law demanded it be pronounced in the temple in the hall of hewn stone. The high priest rents his garment. He was never permitted to tear his official robe. If he did not have on his priestly robe, he couldn't have put Christ under oath. So take your pick. So, okay, we've been through six trials. And uh, so uh, we didn't get into the Herod thing. But we, the next one, the final one, will be the next chapter as we pick up that. What I want you to do for the next session, prepare by studying not just chapter 19, the next chapter. Uh, I'd like you to read the corresponding chapters in the other Gospels, Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23. And while you're at it, you might also read carefully Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. We'll be talking a lot about those. Psalm 22 describes the medical details of the crucifixion some 700 years before the fact that are so precise there are articles in the American Medical Association Journal, Association Journal that, that detail the cause of death. And it's a, a non-trivial piece of prophecy there. And, uh, okay. So with that rather superficial summary, uh, let's stand, or let's uh, just bow our heads for a word of prayer. I do encourage you to read the parallel accounts of all four Gospels of the 
materials as we go forward for these final four chapters of John's Gospel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We're awed as we recognize its precision. We're staggered as we begin to appreciate the extremes you've gone to that we might have life. We do pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you might help us to more fully appropriate these things to ourselves, that we indeed might grow in grace in the knowledge of our precious Savior, that we indeed might be more pleasing in thy sight, that we indeed would be more effective stewards of the opportunities you bring before us. As we commit ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our precious Savior indeed, the Lord, Yeshua, our Mashiach.